in cinemas March 3rd. Welcome back. You're watching Australian Agenda, where Troy Bramston, Paul Kelly and I are speaking to the Deputy Prime Minister and Nationals Leader, Barnaby Joyce. Mr Joyce, uh, if I could just go back to the superannuation story that's in the Sunday papers today. Uh, you played a fairly dead bat on it when I asked you about it before. I can understand that. The details are a little bit sketchy in terms of how much the government may or may not take up this idea that's been put before them by the reports from an industry group. Uh, but can I ask you, in the context of your constituency, regional workers, um, how do you feel philosophically, I suppose, about uh, the difference between them getting an extra 60 bucks a week in their pay packet if you were to remove compulsory super for low-income workers in the regions versus whilst they might not have enough to retire on from their super, they would have an extra fifty or $100,000 uh, if it was to remain compulsory, which they wouldn't have uh, if it was taken away for that weekly injection into the pay packet. How do you feel about that? Well, I suppose the thing you have to look at, Peter, is that ultimately uh, low-income workers uh, more than likely will end up on the pension. Uh, that is, uh, that will be their, their, their greatest form of sustenance when they retire. Uh, so w what they have in super is, is in addition to the pension. We obviously want those who can save to save and not rely on the pension because, as you say, we've got to try and reduce our expenditure. And one of, the, one of those recurring expenditures, one of the biggest ones, as you know, when you get your receipt, is your welfare payments. Therefore, anything we can do to make people self-sufficient, we should drive at. But to answer your question in a more pertinent form, uh, if people invest that money at a younger age in a substantial capital <coughs> asset, such as the house they live in, then I think that that will be well, you know, fit them out well for later on in life. One of the greatest advantages you can have in this nation is to be the owner of your own dwelling and people in regional areas who are generally on lower wages also have cheaper houses and if we can invest that into a house and by the time of the retirement they own a house uh, then ultimately they're well, well fitted out so that if they receive the pension and own their house they're in a better position than most. Uh, now but I'm are, you, are you talking about another option the there? Are you talking about like the option of no, perhaps no, being able to you, use you your are, super for a, for a home no, deposit? No, what you did, Peter, there was very clever. You asked me for my own personal opinion, and so I gave you my own personal opinion as your little old Bush accountant, and if you like, I'll send you the bill for it later on. <laughs> but uh, so what, what, you know, it's, it stands to reason that if you have an appreciation, appreciating capital asset that you're investing in, then you are a benefactor over that over the long term. You saw someone today, well, there's a house in Bronte, they bought it for £100 and sold it for £2.6 You can see that... Um, obviously the person who bought it's not alive, but you can see that capital assets appreciate over the longer term generally, and they do in a growing economy such as Australia's. So if people in the country have a capacity to buy uh, into a house, houses are cheaper. I bought my first house, uh, Peter, with my wife, it cost me $71,000 now. Um, so you, you can do a lot more with a smaller amount of money uh, to get yourself set up for later on in life. Mr Joyce, you are the 13th leader of the National Party in Australia's history. Can I ask you how you want to put your personal stamp on the party organisation? Um, one area that's often been mentioned in recent months, and Larry Anthony, the National Party president, mentioned uh, this recently, and that is about trying to encourage more women um, into the National Party's ranks and also into Parliament. I think the National Party only has about three out of 21 women um, in its parliamentary ranks. Um, so how do you want to change the party and is encouraging more women into Parliament going to be one of your priorities? Well, I, I think there's, there's two sides to that question. And if I could just start with the last part first. The National Party will and is evolving to reflect the constituency it represents. Now, I've, I'm still on the land. I still, I still have property, but I'm an accountant. Uh, and more and more, our constituency is living in weatherboard nine, brick and tile. They live on streets. The, the garbage truck comes around. They live in regional towns, but they, they live in towns and regional cities. In driving um, women in, and we have our first deputy, uh, Fiona Nash, a, a lady I've worked with for 10 years now, uh, we have, uh, I think it's best that we go out and basically um, try and create the atmosphere and actually tap people on the shoulder and, and assist them in their political career to get into politics, and we're doing that all the time. I, I could go through a whole range of people that, you know, we're discuss that we are talking with all the time whether they're Giovanni Webbs in, in the Northern Territory, whether they're Catherine Marriott's in Western Australia, um, you know, the people who have underpinned my political career, the Lenore Johnsons, um, the Denise Giants, um, whether it, it all around the Susan McDonald's who've had a, a strong involvement. We're all the time making sure that we make the way clear and give 
a, 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 a party that is friendly, that is welcoming, uh, that represents their philosophical views of supporting regional areas, supporting small business, supporting the right of the individual to progress through the, so the social stratification and go from the bottom to the top, to make sure that we stand behind our sort of soft commodities, to not forget our soul, which is, which is in farming, which is with people on the land. Um, but I don't think we should do that via a quota system, if that's what people are inferring. I think that's, to be honest, patronising and a little bit belittling. Uh, nobody wants to arrive at any job and find their reason that the reason they're there is because of their sex or because of their colour or because of their religion. They want to find that they arrived at that job because of their competencies. What, what and about their capabilities. the quota for the nationals within the coalition on the front bench? Uh, well, that that's a political that's a political business decision, and uh, you know that in any we also believe in business, and you sit down with your business partner and. These are the agreements that you draw up. It's like saying, when I buy a house, do you accept the price? Well, you do if you want the house. OK, can I ask you about the electoral battle that the National Party faces at the election due later this year, but particularly about the impact of the Greens that they're having in rural and regional Australia? Only a year ago, uh, the National Party lost the seat of Ballina to the Greens on the New South Wales north coast. Do you see a need for a different type of National Party on the coastlines of Australia? Uh, no, I, I actually see it somewhat... Uh, I remember in the debate about who was going to end up with the seat of Lismore and the Greens uh, claiming that they'd won it, and I made what I thought was an unremarkable statement that I can't see the Meat Workers Casino giving the Greens their second preference, and they didn't. And, uh, of course, Thomas George came back, and I think he had the two-party preferred 2% two margin. What you're seeing with the Greens is uh, they're coming into the left side of the Labor Party, and where you see that sort of, uh, sort of inurban... Uh, higher wage job area that there is a real threat to the Labor Party. Uh, what I think we have to do is make sure that our door is well and truly open for those uh, blue collar conservatives and uh, others within the Labor movement who feel that if the Labor Party is the place, place where the Greens reside, then they're going to reside somewhere else. Because if you drive part down the coast and see all those people with their tinnies out and they like to go fishing and come up with a policy that uh, you believe recreational fishing is evil, uh, that any person who eats meat is somehow uh, below contempt, um, I, I don't think you're going to get many votes. Well, and what I want to do is make sure that those votes come to us. Uh, Minister, um, you've taken a strong uh, position against uh, carbon pricing and an emissions trading scheme. Um, is this an ongoing uh, commitment of the National Party or might you at some point be prepared to revise that uh, position? Well, you know, we've, we've made our position on the carbon tax quite clear in the, in the coalition agreement that we've drawn up and uh, you know, that, that won't be revisited, uh, not certainly for this term of government. Uh, we, that that decision has also been made, I think, by the Australian people. Uh, we, we believe that if you're going to do something for carbon reduction, for, uh, for basically doing our part globally, then we should do it in, clear, in a clear understanding of what the globe is doing and what uh, we can do as an economy without sinking ourselves. All these things, as you know, Paul, are clearly linked. If you, you, we have all these sort of multiple arguments, people, uh, they want the National Disability Insurance Scheme, sure, it's a, it's a, it's a worthwhile and noble thing. Um, they want better hospitals, sure. We want a broadband network, sure. But we've also got to make money. We've, as an economy, we've actually got to go out there and uh, be resilient and grow the economy. And if we put too many caveats and uh, um, basically impediments in our way, then we, we can't do that. We just have to be adults in, in, this, uh, in this discussion. We have to first and foremost say that if you want the standard of living that you're enjoying at the moment, then you have to make sure you've got an economy that's able to generate that income. And it can't generate it on some sort of mythical belief that some marvellous thing will happen in the future that will make up uh, for your mining exports or make up for your rural exports. Uh, you've got to talk about the here and now and make sure that you are doing everything within this economy to, to, to build on your strengths and to be uh, basically truthful on exactly where your money's earned. And I believe that the, the carbon tax was, n was not being truthful for where our money was actually being earned and was going to be a massive impediment and cause us problems. Now, as you say, uh, this particular provision is in the coalition agreement, uh, the opposition uh, to any uh, carbon tax or pricing mechanism as, as such. So I assume, therefore, you're very confident that uh, Malcolm Turnbull uh, will stick by that position and honour that position? Well, uh, look, we are merely months away from the election. I, I, I haven't been part of any discussion 
anywhere. And this, I, I don't think it's, it, it's wrong to disclose a, a discussion that never happened, if you to confirm. There's not been any discussion about revisiting the carbon tax. OK, can I ask you about sugar? Um, uh, we've got uh, the Queensland government here uh, involved in moves which involve the re-regulation of the sugar industry. What's your position on this overall? Well, first of all, you know, this re-regulation of the sugar industry, the, the re what drove this decision, and you're referring to the, the sugar code that's gone through the Queensland Parliament with the support of the Liberal National Party and uh, Robbie Catter and Shane Knuth. What you see there is that sugar growers, rightfully so, say that they want more than one person to be able to sell their product to. If I was to say, look, we're just going to set up an area where there's only one television station and you're going to have to listen to it, you would say that's outrageous. So, so why is it justified that in certain areas we only have uh, one body, and it's a private body, that can buy their sugar uh, and you just have to trust them that it's the best price? All the sugar code does, Paul, it puts another buyer in the market, and surely those who believe in a market economy would agree with that. Therefore, you can test the validity of your price and the honesty of your price by a, com a comparative analysis to another person who may wish to buy that product. And this is what it does. And now the way it's been drawn up by others uh, is something entirely different. See, what we had in the past, Paul, we had a cooperative that purchased the sugar. And so what's the point of exploiting yourself? There was a presumption that they would always find the best job. When this cooperative was privatised and then sold off to an to a, to a, uh, to a overseas entity, you don't have a cooperative structure. Therefore, you have you, so you can't have two mills in a district. Only one is financially able to support one. All the railway lines that go from the fields go to one mill. So there's an inherent structural monopoly there. And what the sugar code does is say, says, well, we will allow another person on the other side of the mill to be buying that sugar. And what the mill said was, no, we don't want anybody else to buy the sugar except us. Uh, and it's, non, it's unsurprising that this caused conflict. Can I just ask on another subject, uh, what's your view of the uh, gender diversity program uh, now in Australian schools, which has been highlighted in recent times uh, by the Australian newspaper? Uh, under this program, uh, students are told not to uh, refer to boys and girls, uh, that, uh, that uh, gender is an issue which they can determine themselves. Uh, given your commitment to social conservatism, I just wonder if the National Party and yourself as Deputy Prime Minister has a view on this program which is being funded by the Australian Government. Uh, I acknowledge the concerns that are held by this and uh, this was a program that was brought in by the previous government, the Labor Government. Uh, I, I think that uh, in any school the vast majority of teachers would say that uh, you know, we have a clear identification for very good reasons as to who is a girl and who is a boy and uh, that people feel safe when they go to the bathroom that they, that they are that they're not going to be have some sort of process manipulated in such a way that they would find uncomfortable or in some instances uh, uh, beyond that. Uh, I, I, I think that uh, sometimes this issue of uh, Political, it's not even political correctness, but, politi but philosophical, social entrepreneurship uh, works completely at odds with what the mums and dads who send their kids to school want. And uh, we will always be on the side but of the mums what, and dads, the overwhelming majority who send their kids but what, to school. What, what about uh, the government's position, though, on this? Because we had the Education Minister here on Australian Agenda last Sunday, and he said that he supported the program's objectives. He did point out that there were some concerns on the edges. George Christensen, obviously, who's uh, part of your party, uh, has absolutely slammed it and said that he will do what he can uh, to bring it to an end. It was brought in by the previous government, but it has continued to be funded by this government. Well, what we have is uh, we have uh, two, I think, uh, concurrent views. We have the education minister saying there certainly needs to be some changes, and we have George Christensen saying change it completely. Um, and I've also expressed today that you know, my, my concerns about a form of uh, almost social entrepreneurship that's at odds with the families who send the kids to the school. So everybody is believing there needs to be changes of, of some sort. Can I ask you about same-sex marriage? Uh, the, the Coalition, of course, has a commitment to a plebiscite um, on the issue of same-sex marriage. If that plebiscite endorses same-sex marriage, will you vote that way in Parliament? Well, uh, I, I will always respect the view of the Australian people. If that's what the Australian people want, then, of course, that will be respected. Uh, now, 
what we have in this is we have a plebiscite, so I get one vote, you get one vote, all your listeners get one vote. Um, everybody can, I, I think this is an issue which everybody knows where they are on it. Uh, to be honest, they, they don't particularly want to vent on it, they just want to get, get on with it and have their own vote. Uh, and uh, their views are many to vary, they'll be able to go and express them in the ballot box. When the Australian people come up with an outcome, um, I think the, the Parliament will respect that. But when you say respected, Barnaby Joyce, I mean, you've been very clear in your position uh, opposed personally mm. to same-sex marriage. That's fine. There are That's different views correct. in the community. Would it be fair and reasonable for people uh, where it might be on religious bases, for example, that they oppose same-sex marriage, but they're in the parliament, are they still respecting the plebiscite if they, for example, just abstain from voting? They're not voting against it, they're not well, voting against the result, but they decide uh, not I've, to put themselves in a, a contradictory position for their own personal in, in, values. In anything, in any issue, you have... Uh, we, we don't believe in our parties that you can hold the gun to people's heads, but I think ultimately uh, that they will respect the view of the Australian people. And if the Australian, whatever decision, remember this works both ways. You've got to also ask Penny Wong what happens if the Australian people decide that we won't redefine marriage? Is, are you going to force Penny Wong into the chamber to, to vote for the, to, to endorse? The, uh, the current definition of marriage, the traditional form of but marriage. But her side of politics uh, are uh, against uh, the plebiscite. But if there is a plebiscite and the Australian people decide that they want the current definition of marriage, the traditional form of marriage the current, as it currently stands, are, are we all going to, therefore going to drive Penny Wong and anybody else with a, with, a, with a completely divergent view that we completely understand and respect into the chamber and force her to, to vote or endorse a position we know she inherently doesn't believe in? Well, that's not the sort of parliament I want to be in. It might be the sort of parliament other people want to be in, but not the one I want to be in. I want to ask you about water in particular, going back to your portfolio, if I can, uh, Barnaby Joyce. Now, it's something that um, in, in the, under the new prime ministership uh, and the new arrangement between the coalition uh, that you now have responsibility for, uh, do you want to do big things in that space? And if so, what are we talking about? Well, I think that water is wealth, and whether you're in Sydney there at the moment, and we can see the work that through our history, but Lachlan Macquarie did right at the start when we only had about 36, 37,000 people in the 1822 census, but he had a vision to water infrastructure. He knew that there was a seed that drove uh, that section of the economy forward. When Kurt and Chifley and Menzies all stood behind uh, in a very torrid debate to get the Snowy Mountains scheme uh, up and running, that, that obviously Australia and Sydney has been a massive benefactor of that. Uh, we see no matter where we are, you will not have uh, a town, you won't have an economy unless you have water infrastructure. I think it is the, the source of wealth and you can see it, uh, it clearly ex ex uh, expounded in certain issues such as if I get a, a, an irrigation dam in uh, and I have a dry acre of land, it's probably worth maybe two or three hundred dollars, if I can get water onto it, it becomes a, a land worth uh, five, six, seven, up to thirteen thousand dollars an acre and I'm thinking of my experience in St George here. The reason being is the productivity of that land goes through the roof. Uh, therefore, it, is the, it does drive the capacity of our economy to get bigger, and I think we should stand behind that. Uh, it drives the capital base of our economy forward. It, it is not wasted money. It is when you invest money where you make money that, that drives the size of your business to be bigger, to be better, then that is a, a prudent and worthwhile investment. So too long in this nation we've been scared, we've been almost politically bullied or out of the space of building uh, infra water infrastructure and I think now's the time that we should go back into that space and it's great to be able to go around central Queensland, especially on the Fitzroy, the biggest catchment that flows out onto the eastern coast of Australia, the second biggest catchment in Australia and to see the potential that is, that is still there. Uh, now, uh, this is the potential to stand behind the exports of our cotton, of our uh, protein grains such as your chickpeas, of, of uh, silage for beef. It, it stands behind where we have, and even McKinsey's have seen this, we have a strategic advantage that is in our soft commodities, a global strategic advantage. Um, and you know, I think that we should be doing things in, in that space now, uh, not just for our term of government, but for the nation as a whole. Mr Joyce, would you like to see the Parliament run its full term and a normal election be held around September this year, or do you think a snap double dissolution election should remain a live option for the government? Um, well, I think that uh, after, the, after the 1st of July, we were July, August, September, October, you're talking four months, and somewhere in that space there'll be an election, and I think we're really splitting hairs about this. It's, it, it, I don't think there'll be an election... Um, before July um, and really 
I can say I don't think because no one really knows when the election will be. Uh, what I can say is any time after July there, there's the possibility and uh, it really is up to the, the Senate as to how whether we have a progression of, of policy through, uh, whether we have the capacity to get on with the job of, make, of turning the nation around and, and uh, putting ourselves in a strong financial position for the future. But if it becomes inoperable, then we have we have a right, a constitutional right, to go to a double dissolution, and we we'll always keep that option up our sleeve. Barnaby Joyce, Deputy Prime Minister, congratulations once again. You've been generous with your time. We appreciate you joining us here on Australian Agenda. Thanks. Thanks for that, Peter, Paul, Troy.